and we are here with a very special guest, one of the greatest in Hawaii football history, one of my favorites, a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. We're here with former University of Hawaii and former NFL wide receiver, Devon Bess. What's up, man? What's going on? How you doing? Doing well, man. Doing well. Like I said earlier, just, you know, kicking back and just taking it one day at a time, man, you know? What's the present life been for you during this COVID-19 pandemic? It's been, you know, I wouldn't say challenging. I know there's a lot more people in this world and in our country, in this world, that's suffering more than I am, you know, so that kind of keeps me motivated and keeps me going. You know, my children are at home school right now, pretty busy and pretty active with them throughout the day, whether, you know, it's helping them with assignments or working them out in between classes and, you know, just trying to keep them active and keep them going since they're not really getting that social aspect from school. Other than that, just hanging out with family, man, you know, making up for time, you know, when I was playing ball and real busy and all of that. So just enjoying family right now. Lately, I've been seeing that you've been sharing a lot about the mental health awareness. If you want to talk about that, you can. If not, that's fine. I'm an advocate of it. One of my missions and one of my goals, one of my purposes, you know, that I've recently discovered, which, you know, just to bring awareness to it, man, because there's so many people, not only in, you know, football or the NFL and NBA and sports, but just in life in general, heavily affected by mental health. We don't take it serious enough. From that standpoint, you know, just trying to use my experiences, you know, to, to try to help and shape somebody else's situation, man. And that's, uh, that's, that's what I'm all about. When was your realization that you realized football was going to be your career? And what do you enjoy about the sport? Well, I was, you know, growing up in Oakland, California, I was a basketball and baseball player. I didn't start playing football until I got to high school, sophomore year. My high school coach started introducing me to college scouts. You know, growing up in Oakland, you know, you, you're either, you know, trying to make a quick dollar off the streets, just hustling, trying to make it day by day. You know, college is kind of on the back burner. When he started introducing me to these college coaches, showing me an example that I can make it out and, and be a difference and try to be something for my, not only for myself, but for my community, I was all in. Basically, I was committed to whatever plans that my coach had for me, whether that was doing better in school, seeking extra help after school, trying to get my grades up, really focusing on the SAT and, you know, that whole journey, you know, trying to get to college. It was all new to me. Nobody really in my family had had, had ever gone to college, you know, maybe a few, but not that many. It was a new experience, you know, me and my mom, you know, trying to figure that avenue out. So my coach, very influential, making that process easy for me. I didn't, like I said, I didn't start thinking about football until my sophomore year in high school. Once I got to Hawaii, I didn't start thinking about the NFL until after my freshman year in college. Pretty good freshman season. It was pretty productive. Next thing you know, I started catching the attention of these NFL scouts, respect across the country. Things I enjoy about football, I, I just love the, you know, camaraderie and the chemistry between the boys. You know what I'm saying? Going to war, you know, working hard, working towards a common goal, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, battling. And, and when you finally win a football game together, you accomplish something really special. You can't really put a price on that feeling. Being in the locker room, the ebbs and flows of the game, you know, when things are not going well, and then your teammates and your coaches and everybody is counting on you to make the next play. Having that short-term memory, you know, let's say you mess up two plays later, you know, you can make the biggest play of your life. It'll change your life. You know what I'm saying? So just the different swings of emotions that come with playing the game, you know, the life lessons, you learn so much, you know, discipline, how to handle pressure situations under pressure. It's just a bunch of life lessons that I've learned throughout my career, you know, dating back from high school to college and definitely in the NFL. I just love the experiences, you know, from a mentor and then somebody that I looked up to, like I told you earlier, I didn't play football until I got to high school. I was kind of a late bloomer when it came to football. My guy was Michael Jordan growing up. You know, I thought I thought I was going to the NBA. You know, nobody couldn't tell me anything, you know. And then I got to high school, man, and I stopped growing. You know, I still played. I still played basketball. I stopped growing, you know. And, and, and in order to, to make it to the NBA, man, that's half the battle is, is your size. You know what I'm saying? You got to be you got to be tall. You know what I mean? It's only a few that make you maybe one or two that that's like under, you know, five. 11, six foot, you know, most of them are giants. So, you know, Michael Jordan was my hero growing up. I grew up in that era, 
you know, where, you know, he was winning, you know, back-to-back championships, carrying a team on his back, a lot of help, you know, with Rodman, Pippen, and, you know, all those guys. Resilience, dedication, and commitment to wanting to be great. It was, it was very inspiring. So you've had a successful college career at the University of Hawaii. You played there from 2005 to 2007. And I know you had to transfer from Oregon State to Hawaii. And at that time, I'm sure prior to transferring, you probably had like a list of schools or probably a few schools that were interested in you at the time. So what was the reason for picking the University of Hawaii? And what can you say has been some of your memorable experiences? I never made it to Oregon State because after I graduated out of high school, I ran into a little trouble. I was actually incarcerated right after I graduated from high school, lost my scholarship. I spent two months in a county jail, got sentenced to a year after that to a boy's ranch on the middle of nowhere for a year. When I got out, you know, I had some very, you know, influential people in my life, like, you know, my coach and a couple of counselors, you know, a guy by the name of Amin Denny, Keith Bonifa. They helped my transition from my incarceration to me going to Hawaii. There's a long story behind that, but, you know, I'm just, you know, just to sum it up and keep it quick, they actually helped my transition from the Boys Ranch to Hawaii. So Hawaii was basically my second chance, man. So I didn't really have I didn't have no options after my situation and me uh, getting getting out of, you know, the camp, trying to move forward with my life, you know. So Hawaii was, Hawaii was a blessing, you know. It was, it was definitely a blessing. I think not only the guys I just mentioned, Coach June Jones, he rolled the dice on me, you know. He took a shot with a kid from, from Oakland who just got out of jail, pretty much, you know what I'm saying? So he didn't, he didn't know me from a can of paint. He liked what he saw on tape. And he made it happen. Uh, I'm forever grateful for that, you know. And uh, Hawaii, you know, it's like a second home to me. Hawaii and my football teammates and the people, you know, the culture, everybody embraced me with love, you know. And it was definitely a positive, great feeling to have that, you know, respect, you know, especially, you know, for a guy nobody knows who just got out of jail, you know. Nobody, nobody really judged me, let me do my thing. And they found out, you know, that I was, you know, I was cool down to earth. It was a great fit for me. A lot of great people down there. I met my wife that I'm still married to to this day. I met her down there. Three beautiful children with her. A lot of good people that I still keep in contact with. That's back there, man, that played a really good, a really big part into my transition going from, from jail to Hawaii. One of the most memorable moments, I want to say like three or four months into me, you know, first landing, you know, getting off the plane and landing in Hawaii. A guy by the name of Colt Brennan showed up on campus. At the time, I think I was staying with one of my one of my buddies, one of my older teammates or whatever. We had an apartment, so we had some people over and we was, you know, just having a good time hanging out. We were all freshmen, you know, the year before that, everybody else, they were seniors, you know, Timmy Chang, Chad Owens, all those guys were seniors, you know. So it was a new, it was a new team, you know. So we were, you know, we were trying to bond, trying to get to know each other. You know, a lot of us came from different backgrounds, different parts of the country, different parts of the island. So we were just trying to jail and get together. And me and Cole went out, you know, on the balcony and, and we just instantly connected. We had a heart to heart moment. We both, you know, came from situations where we had second chance. He had, a, you know, he had a little run in, whatever his situation was with when he was at University of Colorado. And then I had my situation. So here it is, two guys pretty much trying to make the most of this second chance that they got. Tomorrow's not promised. We basically discussed that night what we ended up doing for the next three years and that's taken being influential and being a part of something special as far as Hawaii reaching its heights that it did from 2005 to 2007 and you know capping that off with the Sugar Bowl appearance you know going undefeated you know Colt being a Heisman trophy candidate, you know, me being a Bolitnikoff Award, a nominee, really good numbers, you know, and setting all kind of NCAA records. It was just really special, especially when you sit back and and reflect. And when you sit back and reflect and be like, man, we we, we set out a goal and we accomplished that goal. It's a really good feeling. It's motivating. Why is on the map? And you know, that's one of the most proudest, gratifying feelings in the world. The relationships you build while doing so connecting with the locals, connecting with my boys from LA, from Texas, from all over the country. We all came from different backgrounds and different cultures. Coach Jones had a mission, he had a plan, 
and we all bought into it. We all bought into what he was trying to do. We believe, you know, we worked hard. We worked really hard to accomplish those goals, man. And we, we jailed, we gained chemistry as we went. It's an unbelievable feeling when you put hard work with focus, being disciplined, working hard, you know, all the, all the things that people talk about, you know, when you really do it, it's a really great feeling. You know, after the season, you know, it's your junior season, you decided to go play and pursue the NFL. Did you consider returning for your senior season? And, you know, what was that like? Because I because I remember, you know, Colt was a junior. Mm-hmm. And you were a junior. Obviously, Colt say for the senior season and you left the junior season. And also Ryan Grice Muller left the junior season as well. What was that like? Yeah. What was the what was the talks at that time? We had something special going on, you know. We built it for, you know, from 05 to 06 and then to cap it off, you know, going, you know, to the Sugar Bowl. I mean, we we lost, but that whole experience, you know, going to Louisiana and playing in the Superdome, just the excitement and brought to the island. It's hard to replicate that, you know. And then, you know, Colt, I knew he was leaving, you know. I knew he was entering the draft too. I hadn't picked my agent yet, but before I picked my agent, I sat down and really gave it some thought, like, uh, should I come back, you know? And and the first thing I thought about was like, shit, Colt not coming back. Our backup guy was pretty good too, Tyler Grunke. He was a good player too, but Colt was a beast though, you know what I'm saying? Colt was really special. He, he's, uh, he's my all-time favorite QB that I've ever, you know, ever played with, you know what I'm saying? I had the most fun with him. I had the most chemistry with him. I had the most connection with him, but not only all on the field, but off the field. From that standpoint, a lot of emphasis on the fact that I had three three productive years in college, you know, from a statistical standpoint. I was healthy, you know. I, I didn't really get injured too much in college, you know. And then the last thing, I was just eager and ready for the next challenge. So I ended up picking my agent, and he basically said, you know, you, you are going to be a second or third round pick. It was intriguing to me, you know what I'm saying? Because I didn't, like like I said before, I didn't start thinking about the NFL to after my freshman year. What I came to realize, you know, after the fact, in hindsight, a lot of guys that go to the NFL, that's in the NFL, they they dream of that when they when they five and six and seven years old playing Pop Warner. You know, their, their dream is to go to the NFL. You know, my dream was to go to the NBA. I was a basketball player. A lot of things just start happening really fast. I made the decision to come out. I went to the combine. I didn't do too well in the 40. I did well everything else. You know, I didn't drop any balls. I ran good routes. I just ran a, a bad 40 time. And I think it was a mixture of, you know, just the, the pressure, you know, as, as far as me having to run this good time. Because a lot of scouts and a lot of NFL executives and, you know, player personnel, all these guys knew that I can play. They knew I can catch. They knew I can run routes. They knew I can get open. They knew I know how to read coverages. They just wanted to know how fast I was. You know, that was the big deal. You know, so it was a lot of pressure on that. You know, I worked really hard to try to get my 40 going for six at the combine, which is not good for a guy my size. You know what I'm saying? 5'10", 190 pounds. You probably should be in the 4'5", 4'4", range. But at my pro day, which was like two months after that, I ended up running a 4-4, like a high 4-4. I want to say like a 4-4-8, 4-4-7 or something like that. And I ended up pulling my hamstring while doing so. So that was another setback. You know, a lot of people don't know that story. So I wasn't able to perform in front of the scout. I wasn't able to show them, you know, my route running and catching ability like they saw on tape. That combined my past as far as being incarcerated as a juvenile. I think that's what haunt me, my draft situation or whatever, and not getting drafted. You talk about the journey. You talk about the success. You did play in the NFL. You played for the Miami Dolphins from 2008 to 2012. How was it playing for them? And let's talk about that experience. That was special, man. That was really special. It was devastating not getting drafted. You know what I mean? Like, especially having high hopes to be a third round, second round pick, and then you go undrafted. It was devastating, but I immediately went to grind mode. I didn't get drafted. Let's work. Miami was intriguing at the time because they didn't draft any receivers that year, you know, and then, you know, my agent was like, this may be a good fit. They didn't draft no receivers. They got a new coaching staff. So you can come in and just compete, earn a roster spot. And that's what I did. And who would want to go from Hawaii to Miami? The weather guys have have been on my side when it comes to to weather. That experience, it was tough though, man, because like, 
them coaches, man, like, you know, rest in peace to, to my coach, Tony Sperano, very influential in me making that team who pushed me to limits that I never thought I could reach. You know what I'm saying? Who motivated me, who inspired me, who gave me an opportunity. I'm forever grateful for him. May he rest in peace. You know, Bill Parcells giving me an opportunity to come down and, and showcase my talents and Carl Durrell, not only the coaches, but like my teammates. So usually in the NFL, you know, when you're a rookie, you have a hard time, you know, especially if you're not a high draft pick. It's a hard time for you, you know, not only because it's an uphill battle to make the team, but, you know, you got veterans there who who think you're out to come get their job. It's really cutthroat. You got veterans who really, you know, don't want to help the rookie because he think that you're trying to take his job. It can get real cutthroat, you know, but I was fortunate to be around a great group of guys my rookie year. You know, we all had the same mindset and coming goals. You know, we were all unproven. We all wanted to make the team. Everybody was cool. You know, they helped each other. You know, Ted Ginn, Greg Camarillo, Ernest Wilford, Derek Hagan. We jailed. We worked together. The chemistry with our quarterbacks, Chad Henney and Chad Pennington, Tyler Thigpen. That experience was priceless, man. Not getting drafted was devastating, but I immediately went to another level with my focus and my determination to make it, man. You chose the number 15, and I'm not too sure if anybody's ever asked you this question, but you chose the number 15. Any reasoning behind that? Well, that's funny, man, because the way you said that um, is, is not what happened. I didn't choose 15. 15 chose me. So I show up to rookie camp. I got a 15 in my locker. I'm like, 15? You know, if you know, if you know anything about the NFL and, you, you know, you follow it, I want to say prior to the 2007, 2008 season, all the receivers wore 80s numbers, 81, 82, 80, 85, 87. You know what I'm saying? 80s numbers is a, is a wide receiver number. They didn't start They didn't start wearing the teens like 13 and 15 and 12 and all of that, you know, until like around when I got in, you know, like 07, 08, 09, you know what I mean? So I took it as disrespect initially. I thought by them giving me 15 was their way of saying, oh, yeah, he's just going to show up and he'll be done. By them not giving me an 80s number, I took that personal. You know what I'm saying? I had a chip on my shoulder because of that, you know, and I and I and I would look at that that number, you know, every, every before every practice hanging up in my locker before every game, you know, where it's hanging up in my locker. And and I would use that for motivation to to to, to keep going and show everybody 15 became really special to me just because you know, the journey, man, and um, the experiences and how tough it was to make that team in 2008. You know, um, I've been through a lot, but, you know, making that team in 2008 as an undrafted rookie free agent, it was work, man. It was it was really tough. I'm grateful for that experience. And then you ended up playing for the Cleveland Browns in 2013. What was that like playing for the Cleveland Browns? By the time I got to Cleveland, I was still kind of battling my mental health issue. We hadn't really gotten to the root of the issues that I was dealing with, you know, from a mental standpoint. I was thankful for a second, or not a second chance, but another opportunity in a new city, a new start, a new team. You know, I was thankful in that regard, but I loved Miami. You know what I'm saying? I was there since 2008, you know, five years. You know what I mean? I loved Miami. I loved everything about it. I just wish... Things could have ended a little better, you know. I just wish, you know, looking back, I don't want to go too deep, but I just wish I had more support, you know what I'm saying, while dealing with my mental health instead of just me being shipped off to a to another organization, having to deal with those same issues and not addressing the root of the problem. I was grateful. Like I said, I was grateful for the new beginning, but uh, I was still not there all the way mentally. Eventually, you know, I just kind of spiraled out of control all my pain, all my suffering, all my grieving and all my trials and everything that I just experienced up until that point, you know, basically caught up with me, know how to ask for help. I didn't know how to express myself. You know, I wasn't brought up, you know, in a city or a community, you know, where, you know, when something's bothering you, you know, you, 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 you be vulnerable, you know, you, you go and say, this is bothering me. You know, I need help. I need help. This is bothering me. Can somebody help me? Where I'm from, it's all about being tough. You know what I'm saying? So that was always embedded in my head, you know, to just to be tough, make the most of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like get through it by any means necessary. You know, uh, don't, you know, don't be vulnerable, you know, vulnerable. Vulnerability is a, 
is a sign of weakness in my community, you know, and you don't want to be weak. Looking back, you know, today, looking back, I can say I'm thankful for that experience, though. You know what I'm saying? Because I learned a lot. You know what I mean? You got to embrace the struggles. That sounds, you know, kind of far-fetched, but you really got to embrace it. Through struggle, you build character. Through struggle and trials and triumphs and, sh- and stuff like that, you build strength. I think I'm a better person today than I was, you know, back then in 2013 when I got traded to Cleveland. Over time and through growth and evolving and experience. You can't put a price on experience. You really got to cherish the bad times because like I said, it builds, it builds character, you know, and that's what life is all about. You know what I'm saying? Life is a roller coaster, you know, it's ups and downs, you know what I'm saying? It's all about trying to find that balance and that consistency to push forward, you know what I'm saying? And, and keep going, you know what I mean? You can't give up. Life is tough. Life gets tough, but you got to come to grips with there will be better days soon. It'll take time. Like everything, you know, patience in the end game, you got to know that you're going to win. It's an everyday struggle. Don't get me wrong. I'm in a great space, you know, with, you know, with not only my life, you know, just with family, certain friends. I'm just grateful for the experiences, bro. You feel me? And that's through growth. And that's from growing up. You know what I mean? That's from growing up and experiencing challenges. If your career wasn't in sports, what do you think your career would have been? I've always been, you know, really good at, you know, preparation. You know what I'm saying? Just like I texted you a little bit ago. When I was in college, actually, I'll take that back. I'm going to rewind a little bit. When I was at the ranch and I was incarcerated, I met, you know, my counselor. Rest in peace to a mean Denny. He means a lot to me. He introduced me into the software Final Cut Pro record and you chop up videos and you edit and you do all that stuff. You know, he introduced me to that, you know, while I was incarcerated, you know, it was a program that they offered that kind of led me to wanting to pursue a communications degree when I got to Hawaii. And I had a lot of fun with it. You know, I had a lot of fun with it. I learned a lot, not to brag or nothing, you know what I'm saying? But I always been like a jack of all trades when it, when it came to sports, Speaking, I want to say I was solely focused on accomplishing my dream in the NFL or or getting to the NFL once I realized I had the potential to play in the NFL, you know, so everything else went out, went out the window after that, you know, and looking back, I wish I would have prepared a little bit more for my exit from the NFL, you know, we, we as uh, NFL players and collegiate athletes and all of that, we spend 95% of our life preparing for things, you know, whether it's preparing for a test, preparing for a game Saturday, preparing for a meeting, you know, we prepare, we prepare, we prepare, you know, that's, that's, that's the name. That's the nature of the game. You got to prepare for your opponent every week, week in and week out. You got to expose your, 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 uh, your opponent's weaknesses to win, you know, to win your matchup, but we don't prepare for life after football. And I think, you know, all my rough times, you know, that I've recently experienced over the past five or six years gave me a chance to sit back and reflect a little bit, think about who I am, the person, you know what I'm saying? Not the football player, because we we get lost with our identity, you know, because people identify us as this star, as these football players, you know what I'm saying? And people, even myself, at times you start to buy into it, you know, and forget about the small things, you know, who are you as a person? And I kind of lost that, you know, while I was going through my experiences, but I thank God every day for yanking me back, you know what I'm saying? And like, man, wake up, you know what I'm saying? You, you need to get your stuff together. Preparation is, 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 is the key, bro. Preparation is the key to, to success, man. Whatever you want to do, you know, you gotta, you gotta prepare and you gotta work hard, man. In your career, who are you mostly thankful for? And as far as your future goals in your career, what would you say that would be? I can't really pinpoint and say, you know, one individual who I'm really thankful for for my career and my my journey, man, because, you know, the saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a kid, a bunch of influential people that deserves a lot of credit for my success. You know, I didn't do it all by myself. My next moves you know, for my career, just in a good space right now and enjoying life, my wife, enjoying my kids, enjoying the bonds that, you know, that, that we continue to build every day. I got some, you know, I got some things cooking, you know, but I'm not, I'm not going to really discuss them and really, you know, put it out there yet. Cause I, I got a, some other stuff going on. So 
I'm just, you know, like I told you earlier, bro, taking it one day at a time. I'm just letting God take the wheel right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm enjoying life and just letting God guide me. You know what I'm saying? Letting him guide me and whichever way the wind blow me, I'll be all in on that. And when people look back on your career, what would you want your legacy to be? Man, that's an amazing question. You know, I struggled with that, you know, when I made it to the NFL and, you know, looking back on my journey, God set me down and said, it's not, it's not time for that right now. You know, it's not time for that. And I had my hand, I had my head, I had my feet, I had, I had my hand in all kinds of things, misguided, but I don't blame nobody but myself. You know, I go by a quote, you find your true purpose buried and hidden in all the wounds and scars you've developed over the years. You know, all the trauma, you know, all the negative situations and all the hurt and all the pain found my purpose as a man, as a father, as a husband, but most importantly, my journey and my, my message to overcome, embrace your struggles, taking accountability, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror, saying that there's a problem and identifying and, and fixing that problem. I think that's my legacy. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that's my legacy to inspire, you know, to create change, to be the voice, living example, which you will call hope. And most importantly, to be inspiration to people who go through ebbs and flows, mentally stable. I can be that big brother from a distance to try to help you shape your life together from a mental health standpoint, because I've been there. You know, you got to be kind to people. You know, you just never know what, what people are going through. And I've learned that practicing patience, how to treat people. I was reading a, another quote, you know, by Maya Angelou. And uh, she said, you know, people will forget what you did for them. You know, I don't know if you heard this or not, but people will forget, people will forget what you did for them, but they will never forget how you made them feel. That kind of hit home with me. You know what I'm saying? So I've taken pride in, you know, treating, treating people better, you know, treating myself better, loving myself more being more patient, you know, closing my mouth more and opening my ears more and listening, you know, because you never know who's going through something that that can change your life. Just listen, you know, open your ears and listen. So I just want my legacy to be, I just want, you know, I just want people to remember me, you know, as somebody who never, never gave up, you know, even when the odds were way stacked against them. Remember it as a guy who weathered the storm, who prevailed under intense circumstances made it out on the other side that's glory that's power that's 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 the work of god more spiritual than religious you know what i'm saying there's there's definitely a difference so that's what i want my legacy to be man just somebody who never quit never gave up if you had to pick a memorable experience in the nfl what would it be Making the football team in August of 2008, basically not getting that phone call, you know, because when, when cuts are coming, you know, everybody's scared to get that phone call that, man, you're cut, you're not making a team, come in, bring me a playbook. For me, not getting that phone call, coming back in the office or to the facility, seeing that I made the team, they had a seat for me, I made the team. My first child was born that November, and then that December, we made the playoffs, which was crazy because the year before they went like the Dolphins went like one in 15. One of my good friends and teammates, Greg Camarillo, actually was responsible for that one win. You know, he he scored a touchdown, a game winning touchdown. I believe it was overtime against the Ravens to give the Dolphins that win. But for me having my daughter and then making the playoffs and then, you know, going into the offseason reflect just a little bit before I got back on the grind to work towards the next season was special to me. Not only did I grow as a person, grow on the field, you know, I had ended up catching the second most passes in NFL history for an undrafted rookie free agent, you know, and that was, that, that meant a lot to me because I put in the work for that. Just to go into the off season, we lived those moments. My wife was pregnant with my daughter. She came out that summer when I was trying to make the team, you know, so it was like, we didn't have insurance. We didn't have nothing. You know, a lot of people don't know this story, but we didn't have, we didn't have nothing. I didn't have too much money at the time, you know, and it was just like, you know, you got to make this team, man. You know, you, if you don't make this team, what are you going to do? You know, again, identifying myself as a football player, you know, not, not the person, you know, not preparing for what I'm going to do. You know, if I didn't make this team that has its pros and its cons, you know, so from a pro standpoint, a pro for, for, for a pro standpoint, 
it motivated me to make the team by any means necessary. You know what I'm saying? And I made the team leading up to the OA season, the OA season, and then the off season going into 2009 was probably my most memorable. The opponents that you played against, which one was your favorite? I didn't really have a favorite team to play against. You know, I grew up in Oakland, a Raiders fan. You know what I'm saying? Tim Brown, Rich Gannon, Napoleon Kaufman. I grew up in that era. So when we played against the Raiders, I played against them twice. Once in the Oakland Coliseum and once in Miami. And I did really good both of those games. You know what I'm saying? I had the extra little motivation going on. That was special. I wouldn't say I have a favorite team to play against. I just, I, I was just the type of person just love to compete, play at a high level, bro. You know what I mean? And we are here with former University of Hawaii and NFL wide receiver Devon Best. Just want to say I appreciate your time and wish you all the best, brother. Thank you, man. Bless up, bro.